Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us on another podcast. Today, I have the product manager for our clock generators, Kyle Beckmeyer. And today, we're going to be discussing a new version of the SI5332. How are you doing today, Kyle? Hey, Isaac. Doing well. Thanks. So the SI5332 first launched a little over a year ago. Would you mind giving us an overview of you know how it's been doing in that past year? And I guess, what are the new updates? No problem. Yeah, we launched the, the original family of the 5332 clock generators in September of last year. And so far, we've seen tremendous adoption of the product across many different end markets from data center switches, servers and storage equipment into broadcast video, even enterprise switches and communications devices. And then uh, in addition to that, we've seen a lot of activity on reference designs from NXP, from Intel, both in their data center group as well as in their FPGA groups. Also in other industrial type applications like multifunction printers and FPGA acceleration cards. So it's, it's seen a lot of success so far. We've even achieved our first design wins that will start ramping into production later this year. And then to answer your second question, we are augmenting that initial family with new devices that were launched in August that embed the reference crystal inside the package. In addition to that, we introduced a new software feature in Clock Builder Pro for the whole 5332 family, both the external crystal as well as the embedded crystal versions, a new feature that we're calling multi-profile. And this multi-profile feature actually allows the user to store up to 16 completely different configuration files in the same part number and utilize the external hardware input pins to select between those different configuration files. So with the introduction of the new embedded crystal, what are the pricing differences between the original 5332 part and now the new embedded crystal part? Yeah, certainly with the addition of the crystal inside the package, we do incur an additional internal cost associated with the crystal itself as well as uh, there's a little adder in the assembly process as well. So we not only incur the cost of the crystal, but we also incur costs associated with additional assembly steps. So if you look at the price book, we have increased the prices of the embedded crystal version by about 10% over the versions that use an external crystal. And the new multi-profile feature that you just introduced to us. Well, how do customers go ahead and make their configuration files? Is this through the same that we've been using with CV Pro? That's right. Yeah. So when you open Clock Builder Pro and select the 5332 as the clock generator you want to create a configuration file for, uh, there's a new step right at the beginning that asks you if you want to enable multi-profile mode. And if you select that, the Clock Builder Pro GUI will actually lead you in a new wizard that allows you to input each each separate configuration one at a time. And once you've entered the last configuration that you want to include, uh, it just leads you down the normal set of steps after that. And it will automatically assign the proper number of hardware input pins necessary based on the number of profiles that you entered. And then you can go through the, the normal GUI steps of assigning a part number and getting a data sheet addendum associated with that. So I noticed we also issued a PCN for the existing uh, SI5332, the A, B, C, and D grades. Do customers have to migrate to a new revision D? Yes, that's right. The, the reason for the PCN is because we needed to do a quick metal spin that really has no impact on customers whatsoever but it allows us to increase our internal production yield. And so as a result of that, we did have to issue a PCN from Rev C to Rev D part numbers, and we need customers to transition to the Rev D part numbers as soon as possible. To make things a little easier, we have already generated all of the revision D custom part numbers for customers that already had an existing custom Rev C part number. So all they have to do is upgrade 
the part number revision letter from C to D in all of the existing custom part numbers that were generated prior to the PCN. And then moving forward, Quark Builder Pro will only allow users to create Rev D part numbers. Are there any performance improvements on the new revision? Yeah, actually, um, as a result, we've improved the jitter performance characteristics, um, both typical as well as maximum uh, specifications in both clock, gener clock generator mode as well as fan out buffer mode bypassing the PLL. And those are noted in the new RevD datasheet. There are also two very minor modifications to the AC-DC output characteristics for differential outputs. One is the HCSL output maximum rise and fall time spec moved from 400 to 420, very minor. And then in a specific mode for PCI Express clock outputs, we had to adjust the maximum output jitter specification by about five picoseconds. So very, very minor impacts. And these are noted in the PCN that we issued a couple weeks ago. Wow, that's great to hear. At the beginning of this podcast, you had kind of given us an overview of some of the applications that the existing 5332 has been getting designed in since launching last year. I guess what specific SOCs, you know, CPUs and FPGAs are they getting designed with? Sure, uh, yeah, that's a good question. So we have been working hard with all of our reference design partners but you know those new designs won't get rolled out for another year or two. But in terms of the existing designs that we are achieving, customers are using SOCs, for example, in switches, either enterprise or data center switches. They're using silicon from Broadcom, you know, the Trident and Tomahawk series, mm -hmm. as well as other switch SOCs available in the market, like from Marvell and Cavium. So in, that's in the switch space. In the server and storage space, we're getting wins on Intel-based platforms as well as AMD-based platforms. So those are the two powerhouses there. And then when you look at the broader you know, industrial market, it's largely based on FPGAs from Intel as well as Xilinx. And we've aligned the specifications for 5332 in terms of phase noise and jitter performance well within the current generation of FPGA requirements from Intel and Xilinx. So a broad spectrum of different applications using FPGAs will find homes for the 5332. And then lastly, we are ramping up engagement with NXP on their layer scape processors, which used to be known as Core IQ, which are very broad-based, industrial-based processors. And 5332 is, is well aligned with the jitter performance targets on those platforms as well. Yeah, this is great to hear. And I think that's all the time we have today, but I want to thank you again for taking the time to speak to this podcast. Is there any last thoughts you want to add about the 5332? No, we're, we're very bullish on uh, ramping this product in the next year or two in terms of production and look forward to, to seeing 5332 on more reference designs in the future that are show up at your end customers. Awesome. Thanks again, Kyle, and you have a good day. All right. See you later.